James Aton Edwards. And I'm the executive director of the International Preparedness Network. And we're a non-governmental organization based in New York City uh, that teaches civilians and professionals to mitigate against and respond to uh, all the different types of natural, technological, environmental, and civil disasters. My father was in the Strategic Air Command, SAC. He was involved in, you know, the whole thing with the Cuban Missile Crisis. He came home and he told my mother, he said, Doris, this is it, you know, could be the end of the world. And, and I remember that. It influenced me. And, and it was just something that led me down this path. I'd been fascinated by disasters and emergencies. And every single skill that you could basically develop that dealt with survival, I started to deal with it and master it. And um, it was a hobby at first. And slowly, over the course of uh, you know, many years, it became a profession. What's happening, man? All right. I've invited Dr. Kamal Kakai, who's a friend, and he's also a holistic physician and a medical doctor here in New York City, who feels that preparedness should be incorporated into every physician's practice, that you can't have a wellness program by eliminating uh, one of the most important components, which would be emergency preparedness. Yeah, you ready? I don't know, man. We got a lot to plan. Join me on these four days. My name is Aton Edwards. I'm the executive director of the International Preparedness Network. For seven years, I was the resident expert on disasters and emergencies at KISS FM, WRKS FM in New York City. A caller called the radio program to ask about what disasters do I think that we would see in New York City. And I told her that I felt that there would be a large-scale event in New York. Little did I know that I'd wind up actually predicting the actual 9-11 incident. We basically pegged the uh, time of the attack, the location, you know, the time of year it announced it was going to probably happen in the fall, early fall, September, that it would be probably the World Trade Center, that somebody crazy enough could uh, use a method that was going to be used in France against the Eiffel Tower, which would be to crash a plane into a building from the side. And, and the thing is, is that all this stuff was announced on air. So basically, we gave the KISS listeners the information. And um, so we're going to go up and talk to the fellas and see what their perspectives are now. <laughs> <laughs> is that what it is? Yeah, How are you doing? All right. The audience reaction was so strong. Either they said that he was crazy or he's trying to scare people or uh, he was right on point. We need to do these things. He's so on point. Like when we talk about preparedness and being ready for a catastrophe should want to happen, Brother M. Toomey. And Brother Piggott just said, well, we, we got to get our cribs hooked up. We, you know, we got to have some things in our house so when something does happen, we're not saying if something happens, when something happens, because this is where the brother's coming from. He believes something's going to happen, it's going to happen, they'll be ready for it. I think it's important that you have got to keep this information in context, because to me, if you could sit up and analyze what was going to happen prior to 9-11, I want to know what do you see happening now? I mean, in terms of what's happening now, it's even worse than what happened before 9-11. You don't know how many people who listened to those shows uh, took your advice, got flashlights, got water, mm -hmm. got all this other kind of stuff that they needed for emergency time. You don't know how many people who were listening on the air did that. I know some folks who, in fact, did make sure they had batteries in the house, make sure they had the flashlights, make sure the radios, and the radios that didn't need batteries. And when that blackout hit last summer, They were prepared, and that's the real thing. That's really all that counts. What are we moving into? How? Uh, what is the next the phase going to be? Because right now we get all of this disinformation and uh, the kind of things that the that is being used by the powers that be to keep people in a state of fear for political purposes. But there's no real preparation. I mean, there's no public information campaign by anybody telling people what to do in the face of what may be coming down. No. I mean, you got the red, the yellow, the orange, the green, the purple, the black, and the blue alert system, but we don't have any outreach program. We don't have any first, what is it, first responders, first responders. kind of things, the kind of things that Aton did that day. I mean, on radio, what is that, in February? February 2001. You, you let folks know about 9-11 coming up. You, you tell them that it's, it's a plane. You identify that it's going to be the World Trade Center. And then the tape disappears? That basically cataloged everything. A 
we create an enormous amount of the problems that we suffer from now. And the best way to deal with these problems is to be preventative. Because we're going to be doing some hands-on stuff, okay? Everybody in New York City should own one of these, every single person. This will filter out particles up to like 2 microns, 1.5 microns and up. You got to get out of an area that you think that there's a release. In other words, are you saying we have to inform the people on how fast to run and how far to go? Fine, then if that's the information that we have to give, then let's give it to the people. So the kit that I have conforms to my needs. I'm making things all of the time. I'm building stuff. So my kit has got to like have things that I use as my tools. So I have my tools on this kit. I have like a little hammer slash scraper. You know, I use these tools in you know, my everyday life. I went to see the movie Deliverance when I was a kid because I thought it was about a hiking trip. And I remember there was a scene in a boat where Burt Reynolds is in the boat and he says, uh, one day all of the machines, all of the things in this society, they're all going to fail. And then it's going to come down to survival. Who can survive and who can't. And Burt Reynolds looks at him and smiles, uses a compound bow, shoots a fish. At that point, that was it for me. We're going to go inside and meet Dr. Ken Alabeck. He is probably the world's foremost expert on biological warfare and the weapons that it produces. So we're going to go and take a look and see what he's got to say about what we can do to help to mitigate against this threat. My name is uh, Ken uh, Alibek. Uh, I'm a professor of uh, microbiology and immunology at George Mason University, and I'm the executive director of the National Center for Biodefense at this university. And my main work uh, to find some new solutions uh, in the field of protecting our population against biological weapons. Uh, specifically, we are working on uh, the development of protection against anthrax and smallpox. What kind of threat do you feel that the American population faces at this time in July of 2004? We know about Al-Qaeda that attempts to develop and manufacture anthrax on large scale. Uh, we know about their uh, efforts to develop and test uh, chemical weapons. These people who do, would do this, the terrorist organizations, would tend to use a mixed attack and I think that they would probably want to use a lethal and incapacitating agent at the same time. Uh, the Department of Health and Human Services says to us, they, they say uh, we've got antibiotics stockpiled uh, and if something happens we would be able to provide with antibiotics within the next 24-48 hours. But you know, I don't believe personally that I would be able to get these antibiotics within, within 24 hours. And I want my children alive. In this case, I need this antibiotic now, and I don't want to wait when uh, some uh, bureaucrats from, from the government would tell me that, don't worry, in, in two or three days you'll get your antibiotics. No, it shouldn't work this way. Uh, we need to have some regional, small size stockpiles, for example, which could be uh, accessible to any uh, person uh, within the community just to get this antibiotic within, within a couple of hours.